Hello everyone and welcome to my Fusion 360 Getting Started video. This video is aimed at someone with little or no experience in Fusion 360 and is designed to help them get their designs out of their head and onto the computer as quickly as possible. My experience with Fusion 360 is built around 3D printing technology and a lot of people are using it for that exact purpose. On the left side we have all of our projects. These are where you can group all of your parts together based on what you're working on. I already have a project created for this called Fusion 360 Tutorials, though if you'd like to create a new project, just click the new project button and then it will ask you to provide a name. Let's double click inside of this Fusion 360 Tutorials folder and then we'll just X this out. We now have a blank design file. This is how Fusion 360 will open by default. Before we start creating stuff, let's change or make sure that we have a few basic settings set so that way we can make our lives a little bit easier down the road. To access the Fusion 360 preferences, click on your little avatar icon in the top right, and then click Preferences. Once the preference window opens, a few things that I like to change or make sure are set is that my default orbit type is Constrained Orbit. I find that it's easier to use Constrained Orbit versus Free Orbit when viewing my part and rotating around it with the mouse. My previous 3D modeling experience is from game design in which Z is up. This axis really doesn't matter. You can leave it as Y as that's what most other programs will use like SolidWorks and Inventor. Though if you do have modeling experience, you may find it easier to change this to Z up. Feel free to look around at the other settings, especially the graphic settings. If you have a better computer, you can turn some of these up for better display. And then once you have whatever you want set, click Apply and OK. The part that we're going to create is a cable tie designed to allow you to mount it to a 3D printer extrusion and zip tie wires to it. This is a very simple design and it's a practical one too that I use almost on every machine that I have. Now that we know what we're going to create, let's go back to our untitled file and then let's click the save button. The first step you should do when you're creating a new part is always save it as soon as you make the new file. When you click save, it'll ask you the project that you want to save it to. I'm going to save it into Fusion 360 tutorials and then I'm just going to name it video one. Let's get started creating our part. To do that, we need to go to the Create section of the toolbar up at the top of Fusion 360. We'll see that there's a couple tabs up here, along with this Design button. These are the different workspaces of Fusion 360. If you find that your UI isn't quite looking how mine is, make sure that you have this set to Design, and we want to stay under the Solid tab. These other tabs have specific uses, and we'll dive into those later on, though a lot of work that we'll do will be under the Solid tab. Let's start creating some geometry. We can click on the Create dropdown and see everything that Fusion 360 has to offer to create. A lot of things will start with a new sketch, but so we can look at our camera controls, let's just create a box. If we click on Box, Fusion 360 will ask us to pick a plane to create the object on. Think of planes like pieces of paper that you're going to draw on, and then we'll create off of that piece of paper. Each of these planes that we can hover on represent a mixture of the three 3D axes. For instance, this green line is the Y axis, and this red line is the X axis, and this blue line is the Z axis. We can also look at our view cube in the top right to see what axis is what. Z might change depending on that preference that we had set earlier. For now, let's click on this bottom plane, which is the red and green plane, or the XY plane. Now Fusion 360 is asking us where we want to start our box. And by clicking and then choosing another point and clicking again, we get our box. We can drag up and down on this arrow to make it taller, change the width and the depth. And once we're happy, we can just hit OK or press Enter on our keyboard. We'll want to be able to look at all sides of our part. So let's take a look at the camera controls. If we hold down the middle mouse button, we'll be able to pan around our view. If we hold Shift and middle mouse and then move the mouse around, we'll be able to orbit around our object. To zoom in and out, we use the scroll wheel, or we can hold shift, control, middle mouse, and move the mouse up and down. You may also notice that after we created this box, we have a new icon at the bottom. This is our timeline. Everything that we create will show up down here in our timeline. We can step backwards or forward using these icons, and we can see what our part looks like at that step in the design. The timeline is a very powerful tool and you'll use it in a lot of circumstances to go back and edit parts or add new features in after you've already created other things. The timeline can be disabled, and if you don't see it, 
right click on the top part of your part tree and there should be a button here that will say capture design history. I'll turn that off and this is what it looks like without the timeline. And if I go back up here and hit capture design history, we can turn that back on. And now I just want to get rid of this, this box so I can actually rewind in the timeline. And then just right click on it and hit delete. And that box has been removed. We're going to create our part using sketches. Sketches are very powerful and they allow you to build very complex profiles and then work off of those. Let's create a new sketch and then choose that XY plane again. Fusion 360 should recenter our view to be looking directly at that plane. We can pan around using the middle mouse button again, zoom in and out with the scroll wheel, and let's create our rectangle that will serve as the base of this part. To do this, let's go to create, and then we want to select a rectangle and choose center rectangle. Now Fusion 360 is asking us to place a center point. Whenever possible, you should always design at the origin of your part file. That's where all three axes meet and is represented by this little ball inside of our viewport. If we click there, we'll be able to move our mouse outwards, and we want 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters. If we click again, it will create that shape. It will let us create another shape if we want, or we can right click and hit cancel or just hit escape to abort creating another rectangle. Now let's take a quick look at this rectangle that was created. We see we have four equal sides and a bunch of little icons all around it. These icons are constraints. They enforce a design on top of a sketch geometry. Essentially what that means is that this sketch will always follow these constraints. If we hover on one of them, we can see the other part that it's constrained to. So this constraint here, is a parallel constraint, which is going to keep this top line and this bottom line parallel to each other. For instance, if I were to grab this corner point and move it, we'll see that the top and bottom line stay parallel. If we select this constraint and then hit delete, they can now become unparallel. So constraints are used to enforce a design onto our sketch. If I just control Z, we can bring that back. And now that I've totally messed up the size of this rectangle, let's dimension it so that way it stays to the 20 by 20 rectangle that we want. We can either do this by going to Create and then Sketch Dimension, or just hit the D key on our keyboard to bring up the Dimension tool. With the Dimension tool active, we can click on this horizontal line up here, move our mouse up a little bit, and this is the dimension that we'll create. If we click, it will ask us to type in a value. We can just type in 20 and hit Enter. You may now notice that these lines have turned black, which means that they are dimensionally constrained, and that's actually something that we want when we're designing parts with sketches. Lastly, I want to enforce consistency that this side can't be any taller. You can see that I can move this up and down, but I can't move it left or right. That's because it is dimensionally constrained. I'll hit the D key to bring up the dimension tool, click on this left line here, and now it's asking me for that dimension again. I have two options here. I can reference another dimension or just type in 20. If I type in 20, I get the result I want. When you're typing in a dimension, if you click on another dimension in your object, it will reference it. Now we see this says D6, which means that this dimension is the same as dimension 6, which lets us, if we want, to change this one dimension, we get these other dimensions to update at the same time. I can then put this back to 20. And that looks pretty good. We can now click Finish Sketch, and Fusion 360 will bring us back to our regular toolbar up at the top. We can rotate around to look at our part, which doesn't actually exist yet. Let's extrude this sketch to actually create some geometry. If we click on the Extrude button up here, which is this little blue box with the gray bottom, it should auto-select this profile. However, if it doesn't, you can just left-click on it to select it. We now have some tools over on the right, but just like when we were creating our box, we can just grab this and pull it up. If we'd like to type a dimension in, we can. Let's just set this to four millimeters. And now we have our four millimeter tall box. However, I've now changed my mind and actually I want this to be five millimeters thick. Using the timeline, we can edit that feature that we just created. We can either double click on it or we can right click on it and hit edit feature. 
This brings us right back to that same tool and we can update this dimension as well. We can hit okay and now we have that as five millimeters thick. Now we need to create the hole that we'll use a bolt to attach to the printer. We'll use the hole command, which is right here. If we click on it, we can see what it does. We can just click on this face and it creates a hole. However, this isn't aligned very well as we want it in the center of our object. Let's click cancel. And now we can create a new sketch. Now when we create a sketch, we can either create it on these XY planes or on a face of our box here. Let's click on the top face of our box. And now let's go to create and then point. We can create a point directly in the center by hovering over the origin point of the part. And then right click, cancel, and then hit finish sketch. Now we just have this little black dot on top of our face. If we click the hole tool now, we can click on that point and we get a hole directly in the center of the part. Let's take a look at the options for our hole tool. I already know the dimensions of the screw that I want to use, which is going to be an M4 bolt, which has a diameter of four millimeters. I want to change the hole type to counter bore, which we can kind of see it updating as we go. We can grab these handles and arrows to change the parameters live, or we can type them in on the right, just like with the extrude tool. I don't want a drill point and I don't want a hole tap. The total depth is just going to be five millimeters since we just want to go through the whole part. I want the counter bore diameter to be 7.5 millimeters. I want the counter bore depth of two millimeters and the total diameter of the hole to be 4.5 millimeters. This will allow the M4 bolt a little bit of wiggle room so it doesn't thread into the plastic part after we print it. If you're looking to find references of hardware or other parts that you may want to model around, you can use the McMaster car website. That is where I found the dimensions for that four millimeter bolt. If you just click on screws and bolts, you can go down to thread size over on the left here, click M4, and then I wanted to use a flat socket. We can just choose alloy. And then these are all the options here. If you click on the part number and then hit product detail, when you scroll down, there will be a CAD drawing of all of these files, along with an option to save the CAD file as well. We'll look into this in later videos. For now, let's go back to Fusion 360. And the last part that we need to add are these wings for the zip tie to go through. We only need to create one of these and then we can copy it or mirror it to the other side of the part. Going back to our video one file, let's create a new sketch on the top plane and create a two point rectangle, which is this icon right here. If you get tired of moving your mouse to the top, you can hit the S key to open up the quick shortcut menu. And then in here, you can just type in what you're looking for. This is a very, very powerful way to quickly add features or find a tool that you're looking for. If I just type in rec, I can see two point rectangle right here. Click OK. And now when I move my mouse around on the edges of this part, we can see that Fusion 360 will let me snap onto the geometry that is on the same plane that we created our sketch on, which means I can also access the edges of this circle along with the sides over here. Let's click on the top left and then create this going all the way down to the bottom right. This grid snapping is starting to annoy me and I don't like grid snapping since I like to type all my dimensions in. I'm going to right click and hit cancel and then let's take a look at our grid options down here. If you click on the grid option, we can see we have snap to grid. I'm gonna turn that off since I don't like it. Feel free to leave it on if you like things snapping to the grid. Let's go ahead and create that two point rectangle now, starting from the top left going down to the bottom here. If I leave my mouse cursor right here and then hit the tab key, we can switch between the two dimensions. I know that I want this to be four millimeters thick. Once I do that, a little lock icon appears, meaning that it's going to create a dimension for me. These lines are black, meaning they're dimensionally constrained, except for this one down here. Since this line isn't constrained, it can move around. There's two ways we could do this. We could either dimension it by using the dimension tool and then just setting this to 20 millimeters. Or if we delete that dimension, we could use a coincident constraint, which will make an object coincident to another one, which essentially just means that it's going to be married to it. It's not going to leave it. So if I select coincident, I can choose this line here 
and I want it to be coincident to the bottom left point of our top face here. So if I just click there, it is now locked into place and it can't move. Go ahead and click Finish Sketch. Now we can rotate our camera and we want to extrude this new rectangle that we created. You can see when we move our mouse around now, we can choose between these two profiles. If we hit the E key for extrude, we can choose this profile or this profile. Let's choose this profile and we want to extrude it up eight millimeters. That looks pretty good. Now we just need to create the hole that the zip tie will go through. To do this, let's create another sketch on this face of the newly created wing. I know that I need the hole to be six millimeters wide and three millimeters tall will give me plenty of room to put one or two zip ties through it. Let's create a two point rectangle and it actually doesn't matter where we create it because we're just going to dimensionally constrain it after we make it. If I just click and then move my mouse, it doesn't matter where I move it to because I'm going to type in the dimensions that I want to use. So if I just type three here, hit tab and then type six and then hit enter, we have the rectangle. I can move it around, but again, I don't want to do that. I want to dimensionally constrain it. I want to dimensionally constrain this to be vertical to the midpoint right here. I want to use a horizontal slash vertical constraint for this. And when I move my mouse over this line here, if I hold the shift key, at some point, a little triangle and X will appear. This means that we're selecting the midpoint of this sketch line. If I click to select that, and then I hold shift again to get the midpoint of this top line, we can see that now it is constrained to the midpoint. It can still move up and down, but not left and right. I want to use midpoint alignment again with my horizontal and vertical, but instead I'll use this right line. So holding shift, click, and holding shift till I find this midpoint. And now when I click finish sketch, we have our little hole. Let's click the E button on our keyboard to get the extrude tool again. And we can click on this profile. Now we want to remove geometry. To do this, you can just move this backwards until it goes all the way through and then hit enter. However, an easier way to do this is if we click on the extrude tool again, we can select our profile. And then if we click on another face, it will automatically extrude to that face. So by just clicking here, we can see that it automatically extruded all the way through. Can hit OK. And now we have our hole. All those constraints could be seen as a pain in the neck. However, they allow us to have an updating file as we change other dimensions. If for some reason we want this wing to not be 8 millimeters tall and instead maybe be 12 millimeters tall, we can go back and edit this extrude feature. When you hover on a feature in the timeline, it will highlight what feature it is creating in your part. Let's double click and let's just change this from 8 to 12 and hit enter. We can see that this still updated and is in the middle of this wing. I'll hit control Z and we can see that it shoots back down and adjusts correctly to always be on the midpoint. Next, we'll add some chamfers to get rid of these hard points here on the edge. If we go to modify, we have a whole bunch of other tools that we can use to modify our existing geometry. Let's select chamfer. And then it wants us to select edges. Let's select this edge and this edge. And we can just grab this arrow and drag in, and we can instantly see what that's going to do. When we find a value we like, we can just hit OK, and that chamfer will be created. To make a copy of this wing over to the other side of the part, we'll want to use Mirror. Let's go to Create, and then Mirror. And instead of a pattern type of faces, we want features. We can then select these features down in the timeline to mirror over. I know that this feature is the vertical extrusion, this feature is the hole, and then this feature are the chamfers. If I click on all three of these, it will say that I have three features selected under objects. We now need to select a mirror plane. This is the plane that our currently selected objects are going to be mirrored about. So let's click select, and we get these origin planes again. However, we can also select a face. Just to show you what this is going to do, let's select this face of the part. And we can see what's going to happen. It's going to create a copy all the way over here. This isn't what we want, so let's X out that selection. And instead, let's select this origin plane right here. 
Since we created our part at the origin, we can use the default origin planes to use mirrors. Let's click that, and we can see this is exactly what I want. Let's click OK, and we now have the mirrored part. The last thing from the other design were fillets. If we go to Modify, we can choose Fillet, and these are just rounded corners to give us a very aesthetic look to our part. If your menus are kind of flown out here on the right, you can collapse them by clicking these arrows. And to create a fillet, we can either select edges, or we can get rid of that edge. We can select a face. And Fusion 360 will freak out if it can't create a fillet, and we can see we have some errors down at the bottom right here. That's just because this fillet is too big for this geometry. However, if we zoom in, we can create very small fillets that are compatible with our features. My entire part was filleted, so I'll click Remove Selection. And then if you just make a box selection around the entire part, and let's just type in 0.5, we can see that it added fillets all around. Just hit OK. And that is our completed part. However, we're parametrically driven, which means we can change things after the fact. And because we've used constraints and dimensions, it's pretty easy to update. Fusion 360 actually has a log of all of these dimensions that we can easily access. If we go to Modify and then click Change Parameters, we can see that under our file here, we have all of our sketches and features created right here. If we expand any of these, we can see all of the dimensions inside. This 20 millimeter dimension is what sets the base footprint of the part. I can change this to 30 and then hit Enter, and the part is now 30 millimeters by 30 millimeters. If I go to this extrude feature, which is 8 millimeters, this is the wing height, I can change that to 12. And all of that is still updating. We can change the whole width for the zip ties to maybe we want that to be 9 millimeters tall and maybe 15 millimeters wide. So all of these things can be changed after the fact. And again, because we've used constraints and dimensions, they're super easy to update after the fact. Using these methods decreases the amount of time that it takes you to adjust a part when you're prototyping and doing constant 3D prints. I'm just going to Control Z all of these to bring the part back to its original size. Now that we actually have a part here, let's take a look at this tree over on the left. We can see that by expanding these, we have all of our sketches along with little eyeballs next to each of these things. This will allow us to toggle visibility of those parts or entire groups. When you use a sketch, the sketch is consumed by a feature. So essentially, after we extruded our initial sketch, it became consumed, and Fusion 360 hit it. We can get that back by just clicking on these little eyeballs, and we can see all of the sketches that we had used to create our part. If you want to use a sketch more than once, just re-enable it, and then you can extrude again off of that same sketch. The final thing is to export this model for 3D printing. To do that, we can very easily right click at the top of our component tree here and just hit Save as STL. This will give us the menu over on the right and we can choose to preview the mesh or not along with refinement options. Low, medium, and high determine how refined the model is when it's converted to triangles. As we can see that the circle for the bolt becomes much more refined when we put it to medium and even more so when we go to high. This will, however, increase the triangle count and therefore the file size of the exported file. If we just set this to medium, and then we can go into refinement options, and we can adjust these slider values and see what they do in pretty real time. However, for most things, you're good with just high, medium, and low. And when we hit OK, it will ask us where we want to save it to. Then we can open our desktop, and see that we have our STL file right here. That's going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative. Please let me know if you have any questions. More videos on Fusion 360 will come soon. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.